<clears throat> so um, the way models work is um, basically uh, looking at the development rate of, of the animal. And so for warm-blooded animals, we tend to have a core body temperature that's relatively stable. And the chemical reactions which occur in the body generally occur at pretty close to the optimal range there. And this means that any of the physiological processes occur at re relatively constant rates so that you can predict development rate really looking at calendar time here pretty well. And it really doesn't matter what sort of animal you're talking about as long as you can regulate the temperature of your body. But there's a whole range of organisms that are unable to do that. And so- Can I interrupt uh, in you sex, one second? Sure. Sorry, are you advancing your slides? Yes. Okay, they're not showing up on the screen. It's still um, on your main first slide, title slide. Oh, let me try this again then. Okay. How about there. there? Okay, uh, if it doesn't advance, let me know again. Uh, the organisms, that, though, that are unable to regulate their body temperature, for the most part, this is insects, plants, that sort of thing. They can't regulate their body temperature other than by behavioral mechanisms so that they flap their wings, they move into the cold part of the canopy of a tree or to the outer part of the canopy of a tree. And so the reaction rates, which uh, basically drive development, are solely based on temperature and the amount of time they're exposed to it. And the thing that they, um, or the the unit that we're talking about is degree days. So a degree day is when the temperature is one degree above the lower threshold for development for a period of 24 hours. So it's a real simple concept um, but the thing is, again, because these animals can't regulate their body temperature, we can't predict their development rate by calendar time. So if you take an insect like coddling moth, which doesn't develop until the temperature gets above a, about 50 degrees and hold it at 45 degrees for a long period of time, they're not going to uh, advance to the next stage there. And so we can't predict the development uh, rate by calendar time. And not only that, but age is actually defined by degree days. And so degree days are actually a, a unit of physiological time. So the consequences of this and what it matters in terms of management is we can't predict their development rates using calendar time to any significant degree. What happens last year really won't happen again this year on the same date. So if you're looking for emergence times, yeah, you could sort of average things out, but essentially from year to year, it's going to vary quite a bit depending on the temperature profile that the insect uh, experiences. Plant development is also related to temperature, but with a different lower threshold for development in general. And so the synchrony between a plant development periods, for example, bloom time, will not line up on a regular basis with a particular pest insect unless it has exactly the same lower threshold there. And each insect and plant tends to have a different lower threshold for development where those chemical reactions occur. So in setting the stage for management for coddling moth, the key things to remember is what stages are you actually trying to control? There's only two targets for insecticides at this point. And the first of these is the egg stage. And so it's the entire period between when an egg is deposited and when it hatches that is susceptible to ovicides, either an oil or a conventional material. Or for any given egg, this period on a degree day scale is about 150 degree days long, which in the spring can vary uh, quite a bit depending on the temperatures, but seven to 10 days in Wenatchee area would be relatively common. The newly hatched larvae are the other stage that we're targeting. So once that egg hatches, they either come through the top of the egg most commonly or go down through the bottom directly into the fruit. But most commonly they chew through the top and then they wander around for a couple hours to a day and pick up the insecticide either by walking around or when they start to bore into the fruit, they ingest the pesticide that's on the surface of the fruit. And then a key point, obviously, is once they're in the fruit, there's no spray residues in there. 
And so what we're really doing with these newly hatched larvae is targeting this egg hatch period. Another technique that we use commonly in Washington, it's used in about 90% of the orchards, is mating disruption. Um, this affects the egg stages only. It works by delaying the mating between males and females. And the longer that delay in mating, the greater the reduction in female reproduction. And this operates on a heat unit basis. And we'll talk about that more in just a minute. So setting the stage, the second part here is that the timing of sprays for codling moths should not be based directly on trap catch because you're not targeting the adults, you're targeting the larvae or the newly hatched larvae or the egg stage. Um, spraying when you have the adult trap catch does not necessarily mean that you're going to get good control and probably not at all. On the other hand, the model-based timing is really looking at when those target stages are present and trying to maximize the coverage of those stages. So trap catch really gives you an idea of the intensity of the spray program needed, not the exact timing of it. Um, and one of the reasons for this is trap catch is highly affected by a range of factors, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Now, since all of you or most of you are outside Washington State, I'm gonna give some different numbers and there's a way to translate them a little bit. Um, for the emergence of coddling moth, which you see on the graph on the right there, this is data that uh, we got from about 15 of collaborators and co-authors on a paper we did a few years ago. And you can see that um, it pretty much falls on this line uh, the different colored dots, if it's a clear one in this case, shows that it's less than 650 feet in altitude. If it's black, it's between 650 and 1300 feet. And then you've got some which are what look like outliers here uh, that are greater than 1300 feet in elevation. And if you look at this and extend it out, and we have data that would extend it out to about 55 degrees north latitude, um, it really levels out at that 7, uh, 175 degree days when they start, first start to emerge. And again, these higher elevation areas are outliers. And Utah is the lower group down here um, with uh, data. We broke it out by county, and you can see Box Elder County um, near Brigham City is about 187 degree days, the average emergence time. Cache County, where uh, Logan is, about 162 degree days. Davis County down near um, Kaysville, about 200 degree days, 195. And Utah County is about uh, 215 degree days when they start to emerge there. And you can correct for this in the model by actually including the altitude. And that's what this um, uh, graph here shows is the predicted and the emergence time observed. And with all the different uh, walnut, pear, and apple, they all pretty much fall on the same line there. And so to use the Washington degree day timings I mentioned about, what you do is basically add the difference in the first emergence time. And so for Utah County, where it's 215, and for us it's 175, that's 40 degree days. And so if you expect um, a control measure, for example, to go on at 375 degree days, you just add 40 degree days to that if you are in Utah County. A big problem that we have is sprayer calibration. Um, it really is absolutely required for best spray performance. And the important thing is to get really good coverage. And um, generally to get good coverage, you have to have higher gallonages and lower speeds um, when you're applying it. And for things like oil applications, which target the egg stage, the oil um, absolutely requires that you get good coverage because oil acts as uh, an agent that basically smothers the egg and prevents oxygen exchange from the atmosphere to the egg and basically suffocates the egg. And so if you're not getting good coverage there, if there's a part of that egg which isn't covered, you're not gonna get good control. And so you need to have those higher gallonages and lower speeds. And the biggest problems that we've seen here is driving too fast. Generally, that needs to be around two and a half or less miles per hour. 
um, people try to spray anywhere from three to four miles per hour and they just are not gonna get coverage no matter what. A second thing is worn or incorrect nozzles. Um, you know, a lot of the things like wettable powders and if you're spraying things like kale and clay, those are really abrasive. And so changing your nozzles and getting the correct nozzles out there is really important so that you get a consistent uh, droplet size. If the droplet is too big, you're gonna have a lot of, of um, uh, you're not gonna get as good a coverage if you've got two smaller droplets, essentially, it, a lot of it's gonna evaporate before it actually hits the tree. Um, bad, cover, uh, bad pressure gauges are another thing, relatively cheap um, thing to replace. If they go bad, essentially the entire calibration is off. And then the volume applied, really what our data shows is that you need to have about 100 gallons per acre um, to get good coverage. And um, if you're talking about larger trees instead of some of our smaller uh, high density uh, plantings that we have now, uh, you're gonna need even more than 100 gallons. You might need 200 gallons per acre to get a good uh, application. And then where are all those nozzles pointing? Uh, are all parts of the tree being covered? Because if you leave a spot like the top part of the canopy, then you're gonna get a lot of uh, population buildup in there and then moving down. And that applies to pretty much all the different insects that we have uh, in the orchard. Um, what you can do to make sure that you're getting good coverage is use either water sensitive paper uh, or else you can just spray kale and clay. And the kale and clay you can actually see on the tree and make sure that you're getting good coverage uh, throughout the canopy there. And uh, here in Utah or in Washington state, we actually do um, calibration uh, trials for people to help them do it. Um, and so contact your local extension to see if they have that same sort of service. The next thing is really this importance of timing. And so this is uh, oblique banded leaf roller. There's generally two generations per year, and then there's another one way out here in the fall. But if you apply an insecticide where this green bar or box shows, you're actually gonna take out a lot of these early end stars as well as a good portion of the peak of the uh, late end stars, which would occur there. But if you apply the spray at this point in time, essentially, you're not gonna get very good suppression of the population at all. And this shows what would happen if you do it all through the season. And what you wanna do is apply when you've got these big dips here where the population size is impacted the most and really minimize it in these areas where you're um, not really knocking the population down. So that brings us to a new tool that uh, we developed uh, here and that's called the pesticide effects models. And these use the same heat driven models we have for our decision support system and allows them the user to actually see when the sprays went on compared to the different target stages that are important. We can estimate the effects of a single spray or a combination of multiple sprays on the seasonal population level. And there's multiple rules on how you set this up, but a key one is to understand is that uh, if you kill a portion of the population in one generation, that affects the following generations at the same time. And so this graph here shows if you put on a spray at this point, and this is for San Jose scale, and this is the activity period, this is what you see in that first generation for that scales, that you get a knockdown of the population here, depending on how good your insecticide and your coverage is in that first generation. And that appears in the second generation as well. So you don't wanna always put on the same timing, if you put on the exact same timing here and here, you would really have only a small part of the population that you're affecting. So the reason that this occurs is you killed these individuals that would give rise to these individuals here. So this is uh, going to be a quick just show you how it works and then I'll show you how you can actually use this sort of thing to look at the um, spray programs and how well you, you're doing in your orchard. So this is the uh, website 
you can just choose one of the stations. We have 175 stations in the state that we can use. Um, you can choose the different pests that we have, the type of insecticide, whether it's a conventional um, larvicide or a conventional ovicide, an oil spray, a tank mix, and then organic options that would be available for common moth there. So just to do it quickly, we have two conventional sprays put on the middle of uh, May and the end of May, 14 days apart. They have a residue of 14 days and we did a good coverage there. And if you hit the run model, there's a number of different um, tabs up here you can look at. And we'll look at the spray timings. And so what you can see is that this is the early part of the uh, larval stage that was affected. This is the later part. And then there's a period between them where I didn't do this. You can come down, scroll down the screen, and what you'll see is that uh, I put it on at 0% uh, egg hatch, uh, or yeah, egg hatch, and it was active until 16% egg hatch. The second spray then went on at 24% egg hatch and covered uh, up to about 51% uh, uh, more of this. And so when we look at the pesticide effects, what you see is this is the break that I talked about. And so that reappears in each generation. And this is without any insecticide, or excuse me, mating disruption. And it causes 72% reduction. This one here, the blue line is what mating disruption does by itself. And then you impose the pesticide effects on it. And you can see this knocked the population down about 94%. You can also come up here to the guidance part. And, oh, excuse me, this is scrolling down. And this shows you the effects of each insecticide by itself as if no other spray was done. So for example, on the larval stage, this uh, first treatment um, caused a reduction of about 18%. Um, and then this one about 55%. And then this combo column is if that treatment went on and then both treatments went on. So it knocked it down without mating disruption about 72%. The mating disruption in this case caused about an 80% reduction by itself. And then we added those two materials and we got to about 94%. The guidance then shows uh, information regarding all that. And then you scroll down one more time and you can see what the optimal control for colony moth would be um, based on different timings. So let's actually look at this with a real life example. So this is a 55 acre orchard lease to a management company that controls all the timings and applications. And they told me that they had a terrible colony moth control in 2018. They thought they would need to take it all out of organic to get control in 2019. They used mating disruption throughout the area and they were not using our decision support system. So this is the different treatment profile that they put on. So they did a tank mix of oil and entrust in mid-May. In mid-June, they put on an entrust, a second entrust application, and then a granulosis virus um, in mid or late uh, July and late August there. So if you run the model, what you see is this is the oil spray. So it affects only the eggs here. So it went on sort of at the point where we've already had some egg hatch occurring. And then this is their first spray of Entrust, which is super expensive in comparison to oil. And this is the second one. And you can see the second one really occurred between generations. And in fact, I'll show you that in just a second when we go down. And then these were just sort of randomly applied, it looks like. And so if you actually look at the treatment days, you see that they put on the treatments about every 35 days until the last one. And then they did 31 days there, or 32 days, I should say. Um, but basically, um, this is not something that you wanna do. Um, their first treatment, they uh, first 7% of eggs already hatched and bored into the fruit before they put on the oil spray. And then um, 
there was some overlap, of course, since it was a tank mix. Um, you covered the first uh, about 45% or the, from 9 to 54% of the eggs uh, had hatched. This one, again, was put on at 99% of the first generation done, and it lasted until 1% of the second generation came in. So essentially did nothing. And then these just were sort of randomly applied. So when you actually look at the spray program, this top shows the effects again without mating disruption. You can see that there's big parts here. The red is the full program uh, effect. There's a bunch of windows where calling moth can enter the fruit with relative impunity. This is showing again the mating disruption down here is blue, really knocks the population down. And then even with that bad spray program, they still have areas where there's problems, but they still knock the population down about 94%, even with their bad spray program. If you look at this uh, combo larvae uh, thing here, essentially you see that first spray, the oil did a pretty good knockdown, 26% um, that you would get um, through here. But then the second spray goes on and, um, which was the uh, tank mix, they knocked it down to about 44% of what the untreated would be. But then their next in trust only got another 1% reduction in the population. And then they got a little bit more suppression with the two virus sprays. And then with mating disruption, which is what they did, you can see mating disruption by itself caused about an 86, almost 87% reduction in the population. And then their total sprays that they added after that really didn't do a whole lot, uh, particularly once the uh, first um, oil plus um, interest went on. So again, uh, in, in looking at this, there's that third spray that he put on essentially was during um, between generations. So let's see if we can actually uh, beat that with a really cheap program. So a really cheap program is to use oil. It costs so much less than most of the insecticides. Um, and so what we did is applied four oil sprays about 150 degree days apart. And so this shows uh, what we did was we covered that uh, first generation egg hatch completely and used mating disruption. When you look at the um, way this worked um, here, essentially we went from zero to 16, 16 to 51. There's a little bit of a break here um, to 80 and then 80 to 94. So we covered almost 93% um, of that first uh, egg hatch generation. And so this shows the um, pesticide effects. Um, again, without any uh, mating disruption, you see these spikes, which is that spot where uh, I missed um, just by a percent or so. We reduced it about 77%. And with mating disruption, we reduced it about 97%. Um, and that's pretty much what this shows here. And one of the things is that you notice that as you look at these spray numbers, um, each one keeps increasing there. Um, and then with the mating disruption, it goes way up there. We had, again, the same sort of reduction from mating disruption, but the difference between um, three and four oils is not really all that much here. So. But let's look at the difference in price between the different things. So the grower plan that he used uh, caused about a 93.7% reduction. If we use four oil sprays, it's pretty close to 97 and pretty close to 96 if we use three. But the insecticide costs are dramatically different because oil is so much cheaper. Um, here being you know $150 less and here being even more. The damage per acre that he got a little bit more damage uh, than we did. The total uh, cost per acre is uh, quite a bit less, about $200 an acre cheaper using this oil spray. And then the total for the 55 acres, it's about uh, $20,735 here. 
In this case, it's only 97.90, so it's about $11,000 better. And this one's just even a little bit more so than that. Um, so we looked at this orchard actually over a four year period and, and tried to compare it to that four oil treatments. And so um, this is the average diff difference between the grower and a three oil treatment program. And so it's basically, we won on this, we had slightly less damage, a half percent less damage. Our spray cost averaged about $235 an acre less. The damage cost was about $9 less and the total cost per acre was about $244 cheaper using the oil treatments. And this is without considering the cost of applying the insecticide. So over the four year period, the grower plant lost an average of about $13,420 where they lost $53,680. And if you add the cost of applications, the loss is about 285. So it costs about $62,000 or what this sweet uh, Ford pickup would cost. We've done this with a number of different locations. This is with four oil treatments, but over a whole range of locations from um, areas where I had spray records in the lab. And again, the same sort of trend appears where we have slightly better um, reduction in percent uh, population level. The number of trips is about one less. The spray cost difference is about the same. The um, damage costs about $25. Application cost is about $20. Uh, and then basically the cost per acre doing this sort of treatment is about um, $285 an acre. So it really adds up when you're starting to talk about hundreds of acres, how much cheaper you can be. This year it was available to our users on our decision support system, basically um, exact same program. Um, it allows you to use the current year's data up to that point in time, and then estimate the effects uh, for your different insecticides. Um, and so it looks just like the, the thing to look at your spray records. You can enter it in and we don't actually store these. It's stored in the browser cache. We can't use the data. So it's not Big Brother looking at you and telling you that um, you're doing it wrong or anything like that. Okay, so let's talk money. So this same model can be used in other ways. And so what we do is we use weather data from six locations across Washington state over a, a 13 year period. And we evaluated what the cost was by being late or early uh, compared to the optimal timing. And so we looked at anywhere from two weeks early to two weeks late. Um, all the treatments had mating disruption present and we evaluated two different programs. So one is the traditional uh, larvicide spray program and for Washington State, this would be at 425 degree days. It'd be 40 degrees more if you're in Utah County again. Um, and then putting on a spray 14 days later, which is the residue of um, the normal insecticide you would use that way. And then we evaluated what's called the delayed first cover strategy, which was developed by some of my colleagues, where you put an oil on at uh, 375 degree days, then wait till 525 degree days because this is killing eggs that are just about to hatch. And then it'll take 150 degree days for any new eggs to hatch. And then 14 days later, you put this on. And so what this does, again, the oil kills the eggs when egg hatch would be very low. And then the larvicides are used to control the greater pressure times and it covers more of the egg hatch period. And then we evaluated the final population level at the end of the season and translated that into damage and the cost of damage computed. So this is that thing. This is the optimal timing here at zero and this 14 days early and 14 days late. And the thing that jumps out is this normal uh, program that had been used for you know, um, 30, 40 years um, is the more expensive one almost every single time. Um, no matter what 
your timing is. You're really not covering as much of that generation. But again, optimal timing, it can make a big difference. From here, it's $125 um, either direction if you're early or late. The red is that delayed first cover. It's always better than the um, traditional spray timing at each one of those. And it allows you to be much more loose in terms of the actual timing that you're using. So one of the questions people actually ask a lot is why don't I see the same phenology that you guys do when you do your studies? And there's a whole range of the reasons for it. And one of the things is we do it in very high population areas. So at the experiment station where we can literally get hundreds of moths in a generation. And so, um, we see things that you're not going to see in most commercial orchards where you should be catching, you know, 10 or less moths in a generation. But some of the factors which affect the moth flight and trap catch are really important. So one of these is wind speed. And so this is data taken from a wind tunnel in my laboratory where what we did is we uh, would take male codling moths and uh, have a pheromone lure at one end of the tunnel and essentially look for how many times at different wind speeds they would orient to the lure and actually fly to the lure. Uh, and you can see it drops off really quickly with wind speed. And in fact, none of them either oriented or contacted the lure when the wind speed was about three miles an hour. Now in the uh, orchard, obviously, you don't have a uniform wind speed there and you have trees that block things and everything else. But still, if you look at it, if you have wind speed, you're not gonna have as much mating occurring there. And so we've looked at it and saying, okay, well, instead of three miles an hour, we might look at 12 miles an hour as sort of the cutoff where <clears throat> you might get flight um, in most uh, areas there. Rainfall is another thing. As soon as it rains, basically it shuts down trap catch. And then temperature around dusk is a big part of this. And so they fly from the period of about three hours before dusk to about two hours after. And if the temperature is around 60 degrees, essentially what that means is the probability of flying is only about 30%. So only 30% of the moths that you would expect normally would be caught in your traps. Whereas if you're at 70 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, about 80% of the moths will fly. So that temperature period is really critical. And of course, early in the spring, this is really a problem time in, in most situations to get a good trap catch. If you're using mating disruption, that also makes your traps a lot less um, efficient. And so that's a situation where what you want to do is use the combo DA and acetic acid lures, which are very um, good at penetrating the mating disruption barrier. Bin piles are another thing that really throws off what looks like the model. So these bin piles, this is sort of a, a smaller bin pile, but when you look at this, um, the bins in the center here are essentially insulated from the temperature changes because um, of the way the bin pile is stacked up there. And so you'll start to get some really weird um, emergence period that are off model predictions there uh, if those bins are not disinfected before they come in the orchard. Reflective mulches are another thing. We're using this really commonly now to color up fruit at certain time. And so that's gonna make it warmer in the orchard than it would otherwise be. And um, overhead netting is another thing. Um, it's not just overhead, sometimes it's on the side as well, but the idea is that um, the netting actually reduces the amount of solar radiation coming in about 20% or so. And so that's a big uh, change in temperature under those netting compared to some of these areas here or up in here and down here, which are not there. And so where that weather station is, in relationship to the orchard and whether you've got any of these other factors can really change what's going on and what you would see in your traps. What we have actually done this year, um, just recently, is installed these environmental effects into our adult flight uh, predictions for our models. And so this shows you the last uh, six or seven days 
what the reduction would be based on the different factors and then predicted uh, for the future based on forecast values. And so we'll actually bring out the temperature effects or the wind effects or rain effects and then have that projected ahead as well, just so that you're aware of what's going on. And then you can look at the entire season. The black line here is what you would expect uh, based on the model, but this is what you would expect based on the environmental conditions there that's gonna change all over the place. Another thing is how many traps are you putting out? Um, we tend to put out a number of traps per acre when we're actually doing research and doing some of the phenology. Whereas most of the situations uh, we're recommending people have one trap every two and a half acres, realistically expecting them to have one per five, but people have one per 10, one per 20. And basically these traps don't attract moths from a long distance. It's about 35 feet according to some of the research that we've done. Um, so you're only catching a certain amount. And this is a, um, a plot of some data where we had really 96 different traps in a 12 acre block, evenly spaced over it. And this is what the trap catch looked like at the end of the year. So you have some of these where you catch a large number of moths, 12 or more moths, and then some of them where you're catching one or less. Um, some of the traps got nothing in there. So these populations are not evenly distributed throughout the orchard. And so just putting a trap in one location isn't necessarily gonna give you a good indication. And if you're trying to use traps as an example for um, a threshold on when you're gonna treat and you've got one trap per 10 or 20 acres, you can bet that you're not gonna get really good control if that's what you're uh, basing it on. So how would you actually use trap catch? It is important in the early season with low temperatures, high winds, rainfall, and mating disruption. It's gonna be a lot less uh, reliable than later season values. Trap catch later in the season is affected by any spray that's applied before that. So basically those pesticide effects models give you a good insight into what you would expect to see chunks of population missing that you killed the larvae that would have become adults. Um, what we suggest is you use trap catch to monitor or modify the management program. With high trap catch, basically intensify it. With low trap catch, reduce it. It allows you to check for hot spots in your orchard or sources of increased moth activity. So if you're, it's coming from your neighbor, or it's coming from a bin pile, you'll have higher trap catches adjacent to those sorts of things. If you have really high trap catch, one of the things you can do is check that the mating dispensers are applied correctly and haven't run out in the late season. If, um, again, using them as threshold is not very reliable, uh, in particular, because a lot of the work was done before some of the new lures came out and these new lures are a lot more effective. And again, the trap density is a key factor there. If you don't have many traps and, um, it's gonna give you a different idea of what's going on in the orchard than what you would get with some of the older lures. So we recommend you do not use a trap to determine when to spray and do not continue to spray while you're catching moths um, because the eggs and the newly hatched larvae are the targets and occur at a later time. And that's where the models help you with it. One of the things I wanna point out too, um, just to make it a little bit hopefully more uh, apparent is that population density that occurs in the orchard really affects what you think of the phenology is occurring. So again, traps capture really a low percentage of moths present, probably much less than 10% unless you're doing a mass trapping type of thing there. The highest probability of catching those moths is when the moth population is highest and the conditions are suitable. The lowest probability is this point in here where they're just starting to emerge. The temperatures are coolest during this period. Uh, in Washington, at least, the spring, we generally have very high winds and both dramatically affect trap catch, but don't really affect when they actually emerge from the pupil stage. And just to give you an example of this, 10% um, of that first generation moths should emerge by this point in time. 
in uh, Washington State, 260 degree days. So if your total trap catch in the first generation is only 10 moths, by this period, you would only expect to catch one. If there's 100 moths, you'd catch 10, and only to the point where you're catching 1,000 would you catch a large number there. And so the model actually are done in these high pressure situations so that we see the full curve so that we're protecting the entire period when eggs are being laid. Um, if your trapping program can't detect those levels, uh, low levels of moth activity that you get in commercial situation, it really doesn't mean that they're not present. And so low trap density, inefficient lures or trap types or bad placement will give you the idea that you're fine when in fact you'll um, essentially shift the observed phenology later than what's really occurring in your orchard and you'll get damage. So let's talk about mating disruption. So this is uh, one of the things that people need to revisit every once in a while because there's a lot that occurs for mating disruption to work. So the problem is mating occurs near the top of the tree, which means that your dispensers need to be in the top of the tree to prevent mating. So they are essentially making it hard for the males to find the female pheromones. So they need to be in the same place that mating would normally occur. The mating disruption only affects the adults. And so you need to put those dispensers out early enough that no moths emerge before that occurs. And so in Washington, this would be about 120 degree days. Again, in Utah County, it'd be about 160 degree days. The damage is almost always higher in the border. We did some really extensive sampling of where damage occurs and like 80% of the time it's in the borders. And so what that means is you really probably should double the rate of the dispensers on the borders. You get migration from surrounding areas. If you've got that problem, then you need those border treatments uh, and probably double the uh, border mating disruption rates. You can have weird shaped blocks. So if you have a long skinny block, these are a bad candidate for mating disruption because you've got a lot of edge. <clears throat> and so basically you need to use supplemental sprays uh, or join in with a neighbor so that you can do an area-wide mating disruption uh, sort of situation. If you've got consistent wind patterns, if you're near the base of a hill where the wind comes down um, during different parts, then that is really important because the upwind portion needs to have higher dispenser densities, whereas the downwind um, needs to have a lower dispenser density. Um, and granted, winds change a lot, but there are some places that have these consistent wind patterns. And the reason for this is that if you put everything on the lower uh, side where the wind is exiting the orchard, essentially all that is helping your neighbor, but it's not helping you. So you need to concentrate it on these uh, upwind areas. If you have high initial coddling moth uh, density, you can't knock it down completely without supplemental treatments. And so you need to have those supplemental treatments until the population drops. If you're using puffers, the placement is critical, both the height, of the puffer, the spatial location in the orchard. And again, the borders need these double rate dispensers or supplemental sprays occurring. And a key point when you actually look at how mating disruption works, again, it works by delaying mating. And so you need to have this occur on a degree day scale. And so early in the spring, when the temperatures are cool, you don't get much of a delay in mating. And so basically, again, you need those supplemental sprays early in the season. So in general, one of the key things is to always remember, apply in the early spring some supplemental sprays so that you can control it. But after that first generation, you don't generally have much problem. So another thing is that mating disruption is not a constant in space or time. So this shows uh, from 2011 to 2018, three different locations in the state of Washington. 2011 was a really cold year and 2015 was a very hot year. You can see that you can vary from about 
65% up to about 90% reduction with mating disruption, depending on where you are and what the temperature profile is like. And basically the colder, hot, uh, colder, hot periods and when they occur in relation to the flight of the coddling moth is the key factor that drives efficacy. And so again, uh, this is something um, early in the spring, you really need to make sure that you're getting a good suppression. So for our spray programs, what we recommend, first of all, is using mating disruption um, because it makes all treatment programs better. And the idea of lowering rates to cut the cost is really a bad idea. People did that here in the mid 2000s and they just had all kinds of problems, go back to the full rates and really the problems pretty much disappeared. Um, mating disruption is weakest in the spring when the temperatures are the lowest. Um, the delay of mating is a mechanism that drives the population reduction. Delay again is based on degree days, not days. Um, it requires one to two sprays at least in the spring until the orchard, unless the orchard is completely isolated and the population is very low. Use that delayed first cover spray program if you can. Again, 375 is when the eggs would start to hatch. It kills most of those eggs before they hatch. You can delay your first cover then to 525 degree days, and that works both organic and conventional. The conventional materials with 14 day residues may not require another spray, but if they do apply it when the residue expires. The organic in that first generation, we recommend oil at 150 degree day intervals. Three to four sprays will cover the generation completely. Um, and a big thing is don't wait to catch the first moth. If the model says to treat it, just go ahead and treat it because again, there's a lot of reasons you might not catch the moths, particularly if you're using mating disruption. We do recommend monitoring the fruit damage near the ends of the generations and use that to determine if additional treatments are needed. Normally mating disruption will control collie moth without more sprays after that first generation. If you have damage, look for the causes like the poor timing uh, external source of the model uh, moths, bin piles, um, abandoned or poorly managed orchards nearby. Uh, and again, these reflective mulches and overhead knitting will give off model catches and mating disruptions not properly hung. Um, I suggest if you've got problems with um, coddling moth control, in part, it's go back to the basis, make sure that you've got a good um, calibration on your sprayer, that you're covering everything, that you're using maybe disruption at full rates and double the rates on the borders. Make sure that you treat that first generation uh, when the model predicts um, for at least one to two applications. And then pretty much after that, you're pretty much uh, safe um, from that point on, as long as you got good coverage in those sprays. So with that, um, I guess rather than me reboot, we can ask questions, but my computer is completely froze up. Um, so you'll have to tell me what the questions are. <laughs>